And I'm going to tell you what's going on today. We don't got the money, but we got the time. <laughs> Nathan needs some personal time for himself to take care of some business. And if you want to know what kind of business, none of yours, baby. But he's taking care. No, he's hanging out with family today. Uh, but you know what? We got Deb, a study of UAPs, who's going to take hold of Nathan Chango. Look, I got something for you right here, man. I got some questions. What's up, Debs? Hi, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday to you, buddy. Uh, I know you're up to the task, but you know what? We're going to bring in in reinforcements because we got the new cabbie in the house. He's from Bolton. He's a musician and he's a bat. Uh -uh. (laughs) His name is Frank Jones, the UFO thinker, baby. Woohoo! How's it going, everybody? Making my official cab debut today. I've uh, had a nice day relaxing with the family and uh, very happy to be here. Hope everybody's doing well. It's an honor to have you to bring you in on uh, your your first episode, Frank. And I had a self-edit when I was saying bad mother, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> it wasn't enough to just have you. So we had to bring in another intelligent brother. He's from the he from the other side, from Yorkshire. Put your hands together for David Johnston. The host of Shifting Gears, man. He about to kick off another UFO podcast, but still he's not going to let me announce it. So we're going to have to wait, right, Davey? I can tell you the name of it. Okay, let's do it, man. What's it called? It is called The Mechanism. Ooh! <laughs> nice. Hallelujah. Yes. The Mechanism. Can we say who you're? Absolutely. Please do. UK UAP. Ash, the former brother who was working for the GOV in the UK. He's a he's also a badass. Er. So uh I'm so happy, man, that you guys are gonna get it together. We can't wait to uh somehow contribute to your show in some way and uh and try to, you know, like push it out there. But you know what? Uh we gotta get to the guests of honor today, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. Frank's nodding his head. He said, get it's to time. it. He said, get I'm to it. I'm also. All right. Now, Deb- <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, we really wanted to do an episode of uh, about ancient structures. And I was trying to think of, you know, I think it the idea came from listening to Dan talk on our show about it a little bit. And then uh, after that, I was listening to Frank's show and heard uh, Dave talking about it. And I'm like, ooh. How cool would it be to put Tennessee and Manchester together? So uh, with that, I asked these two gentlemen if they would like to do it. And it just took us a couple months and the holidays and everything else to get it together. So without further ado, he is a UFO Twitter and TikTok sensation who ain't got time for the drama, but plenty of time for contextualization and information. You all know him as, hey, look over there. Dan Warren! Woohoo! Hey, look, Amen where is he? Amen for Dan Warren. That's all I got to say. Um, and on the other side of the ledger, on the other side of the pond, we have a man who know a lot about a lot because he reads and he done educated himself about the world and he ponders both past, present, and future. Okay, and guess what? You're like, why doesn't he have his own podcast? He don't need to because he go on other people's podcasts and bring the noise. So put your hands together for Dave Smithers. Woo! There it wait, let me get him on. This is where I have Nathan to do this stuff. I'm doing my rant. <laughs> there he is. Hello, everybody. Great to see you. Yeah. yeah oh, my I'm God. So- what, a, what an introduction. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, man, I wrote that just for you, David, man. Yeah, yeah. You're a man that got a, not a lot of knowledge, man. Well, I so, mean, I mean, got a good company here. I mean, it's just an interest with me, really. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. This should be a good chat. And you kids in Manchester, this is what, you know what? If you go and get educated, you kids in Tennessee, you go and read, you do your schoolwork, you study, stuff like that. You're going to end up like Dan Warren if you're in Manchester. You're going to end up like Dave Smethers, okay? That's what's up. All right? So when you first mentioned that I was going to be on a show with a guy from Manchester, I don't know if you guys know what Bonnaroo is, the music festival. held in. The, <laughs> I, I've heard of it. <laughs> it's held in the city of Manchester, Tennessee. So I thought I was just going to drive down the road and sit in a room with this guy and have a conversation with you guys. So I didn't know this was across an ocean. Yes, and it's not Manchester, New Hampshire either. Right, we went even farther to get Dave. Uh, <laughs> Dave, um, do you sound like any of the Beatles? Is there? Are, have, are you no. channeling either uh, well, uh, John Paul or I mean, Ringo? You've told me that, DJ. I can't hear it. It's a bit of nuance in England between the Manchester and the Liverpool accent. But I suspect you guys can't really hear it. I mean, we do sound yeah. pretty similar. And we can go like that and talk like that, and then it sounds very similar, you know. And, oh, it uh, sounds like oh, Holly all of a sudden. Oh, oh we can go, hey, oh, like, hey, oh, no, you know, we don't do that. I'll sound like Game of Thrones at that point. So it's, it's very, uh, you know, yeah, winter is sounds, coming. It sounds a lot more like one of the Gallagher brothers out of Oasis, don't you, Dave? Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Hey, now, now I've had enough. <laughs> don't you start, Davey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love these accents. All right. <clears throat> I want to kick it off, brothers. Um, and I want to ask you guys uh, just a general question, and then we'll just, you know, we'll go to Debs, Frank, and Davey. Davey's our, our guest co-host today. Thank you so much, Davey, for doing this. It's an honor to have you. It's an honor to have everybody here, actually. Um, so as we know... Um, that these ancient structures that you guys have looked at throughout the course of your lives um, can tell us a lot about the past. I'm curious, I'd like to go to Dave first and then uh, Dan with this question. Uh, what can it tell us about our future, uh, looking at either one or more of these structures that, that you guys have thought about? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, what can it tell us about our future? What do you mean, DJ? Do you mean in terms of... Uh... What what that's where the tech might take us or yeah anything is there something that I wanted to like ask a question that as I look at these you know we always look at them and think past and so I started thinking well is there any is can they tell us anything about their future can they tell us something we've missed can they tell us uh, possibly where we're going can they tell us where we need to go um, yeah, yeah, that's I'm, sort of I'm, where that question I, I comes mean, from. I think, I mean, it's actually, there's a bit I was going to talk about about 40 minutes in, but we might as well uh, <laughs> talk about it now, really. There is an argument, but we have missed a bit of a trick as a, as a civilization. We use, you know, force, wide electricity, nuclear power, mechanical advantage, very much what we use. And there's a lot of evidence that these ancient civilizations, which I'll backtrack on that, didn't use that sort of thing. They may well have manipulated, learned how to manipulate force, force technology, you know, like field technology, effectively, like anti-grav, like sonics. Sonics is a big one, like electromagnetic stuff. They also might have uh, learned how to power, to use geomagnetic power, electromagnetic power, like Tesla from the clouds. And also, they might have mastered some sort of psi ability, like uh, telekinesis, controlling matter, they've understood something about the quantum. And their technology, consequently, we don't see it because it could look very different to ours. And so, therefore, there may be a, a, a well, a, something might tell us that, but we've missed a big technological trick, and, and that's the sort of thing we may be seeing from other craft or whatever. There is a whole new technological world out there. There's also evidence that they are very much synchronized their sort of agricultural production and science with the living in a very sort of quite harmonious way. So it may be we're looking at our own scientific future, but the irony is it's so different to ours, but we don't see it. We look at something and think it's a quaint temple or a lovely little statue or a nice little obelisk, and it might be actually be something else. Now, it takes a lot to get to that statement I've just said, but to answer that question, that's potentially what it tells about our future, but we've missed the trick. 
and there may be other technological things. And it might be that the others, as I say, the eight, whatever you want to call them, tell us that as well, you know. So that's that's to get you going anyway. Uh, thank you, Dave. I appreciate uh, that that answer. That that uh, is kind of what where the you, you kind of gave us a direction, Dan. So I think I'm a, on a similar wavelength as Dave. I do believe that our ancients, our forefathers, which I want to make sure that something that I I really enjoy about studying these ancient structures and this ancient past is that it's humanity's history. It's not, in my opinion, a particular race or division of humanity's history. It is world history. It is our history. We all get to look at it and appreciate it. And that's one of the things that makes me um, so impressed by it is it, it is a a picture of the greatness that humanity can accomplish if they put put their mind to it and put their effort into it. And we should all be grateful for our ancients to have done things like that that have lasted so long because we don't have anything. We have very few things that exist in the world today that are going to stand the test of time like these structures have in the past. So it's a testament to their ingenuity, their um, the, their way of thinking. Um, that, that it's still there. And that one thing that I just said, that their way of thinking is what I think our future has in store for us. We think in a certain way, just like Dave was saying, what if instead of ha finding petrochemicals, we found some other way to power our society? We would have a completely different look at technology that surrounds us right now. Just like Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison were going back and forth over AC and DC power, one won, one lost. Our, our society looks completely different because of that one change in the approach to solving a problem. Who knows how many times we've solved problems that have had that large of an impact in our in humanity's past. Uh, one of the things that I think is probably it's mainstream for nerds like me that are into this thing, but maybe not to just the regular person that's just going about their daily business is that our society our humanity has been reset in the past. That to me is something that we need to learn from. It's happened again. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. We need to be prepared for it. We need to make to take steps to ha have countermeasures in place to be able to survive and thrive in a post problem uh, world. So what I'm referring to is something that's probably also better kept for 40 minutes into a podcast, but there was an <laughs> event that happened 11,600 years ago that basically wiped the slate clean. We don't remember the details of what happened in the past beyond that mark. That's what I'm most excited about in the future is discovering what types of advancements were made prior to that re that big reset that occurred back then. So that's what I think we're going to find. We're going to, we're going to refine ourselves. We're going to refine a technology that our forefathers had that degraded over time. And you can see it in the way that the megalithic structures of these sites were built. The, the biggest stuff, the coolest stuff, the most precise stuff is always at the bottom. It's always the oldest stuff and it's always the best stuff so that's that's what i'm looking forward to in the future is learning more about our past and being able to utilize it to try to make humanity better can i get an amen for both those answers from both david smethers and dan warren uh both of you guys have just won uh, a can of dj organic skin care and in this case a uh, mustache and beard uh <laughs> what, what do you call it uh uh, conditioner, I guess you'd call because I made it extra thick with more beeswax for the guys. Uh, for the girls, it's a little more creamy-ish. Beard uh, bomb. Anyway. I think that's beard bomb. Beard bomb. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Somebody that's actually in touch with modern society, uh, Dan Warren, unlike myself. Uh, all right. Uh, so what I think we should do, guys, as I pass it to Debs, uh, and you're right. I mean, just with what you guys two said, we say, thanks, folks. Have a good night. That's all we have for you because that, that was a banger from both of you. But before I pass it uh, to Debs, I think what we should do here is each question we should have uh, both Dan and Dave entertain. So we'll just do one, two, one, two punch on, on that. So, uh, Debs, uh, may I pass it over to you, ma'am? Yeah, I mean, I had the same thought about that gap in knowledge that is really peculiar um so for instance i was studying the mounds in north america which were considered prehistoric and they asked indigenous people about them and they didn't exactly know the history and that's very unusual and in egypt they had hieroglyphs and were writing things down and 
they don't seem to know how pyramids were made. So that's unusual. So what are your thoughts about that rewrite or that erasure of that knowledge? Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's the old Graham Hancock thing, isn't it? A species with uh, amnesia, really. It does seem that a lot of the techniques that were used to build the pyramids, uh, but to do all that were actually people didn't have the tools to do that and so there's clearly some sort of disconnect there as dan was alluding to a lot of these civilizations that emerged uh you know the, the oldest ones into the most sophisticated and deteriorated so it's and like with the mound building stuff that seems to be linked to a whole other type of uh southern usa type population just on because a lot of this civilization we're talking about was probably around the old ice age boundaries, you know, with a big ice wall going right down into the USA. And so those that they were probably remnants of earlier civilizations who were much more civic in the nature and urbanized. And those mounds are sort of like the relics of that. They've been built on, you know, on a longer time. So I think really, uh, I think a lot of those so the oldest of those civilizations in many ways occupied previous ruins and previous things and we see little glimpses and fragments of some tech they might have used some memories of science or what they might have done but really the main stuff has sort of vanished i mean remember most of the there was a big flood the sea level rise 400 feet and most of the population centers are reckoned to be now underwater and so you, you could see the Indus Valley civilizations, the Sumerian civilizations, they were merely sort of pale reflections of the other civilizations who were now submerged and merged back, which would explain this gradual deterioration. The first people retreated back, as it were, to form new cities and gradually forgot a lot of the tech over time. So I don't know if that answers your question, Deb. I'm not sure, really. But uh, that, for, for, it's that oh, there is a big gap between the, this ancient civilization and our new one. And I suppose there's these tales of ancient civilizers who came out from the destroyed civilization to teach people again, you know, how to do agriculture and all the rest of it, like Glow Becky Tepe and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm gonna, in there. I'm yeah, going to tag on to something that Dave just said. Uh, we were talking about what do we hope is going to happen in the future for humanity. I've, if you guys are familiar with LIDAR and the <laughs> technologies yeah, we yeah. use to scan the uh, Amazon, and they find just an enormous amount of construction that we can't see with the naked eye. We can't see from a plane, but this technology allows us to pull back the dirt, the trees, the, the, the underbrush and see things that we haven't been able to see before. One of the advancements in technology that I'm hoping is going to become um, feasible and widespread across the globe would be something to address just what Dave said, which is to have to, to develop a LIDAR type system that could be used on the coastlines from 400 feet uh, below sea level, which is that 11,600 years ago time frame. The water rose, the sea level rose about 400 feet across the board. Elevations of land has changed alongside that when the uh, glaciers melted and started moving the ice from certain locations to other locations. But in general, 400 feet sea rise over a thousand years or so changed the face of civilization on this planet. And if we can develop a technology that allows us to use sonar or something to, just like we did in the Amazon, scan the uh, sea floor for the first 400 feet from our shorelines, we're going to discover things that we didn't know existed that are just rumors and uh, handed down from generation to generation that eventually became myth and lore and no one believed them. Just like no one believes people when uh, these ancient civilizations, when they say that they inherited structures, that they inherited sites, that's something that is um, a standard model for humanity, for civilizations. If there's something significant of significant reverence in a location, it's been built there for certain reasons. Maybe it's a proximity to water, maybe it's a high elevation or something like that humanity has a habit and has developed a pattern of building on ancient uh, structures and improving upon them over time so if you look at churches in peru they're built on the um, the foundations of older structures if you look at machu picchu in particular there's three different types of megalithic architectural um, 
that you can see in one location. They have the more the more recent stuff that's small, blocky, and a lot of mortar. They have older stuff, which is a little bit better. And then they have some stuff that just does not belong with the, with the rest of it. And it is true megalithic architecture. It's different. So there's, there's a lot in our past that's been forgotten. And there's a lot that has been hidden because we've covered it up with our modern technology. So hopefully we'll start to learn more about it um, as time goes on. And one thing I wanted to point out that Deb was talking about, uh, the, the Indian mounds in the, the Southeast United States in particular. I've been following this guy. I don't know if you can see this on my phone. Dr. Greg Little. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Greg Little 2 is his handle on Twitter. He's a professor somewhere around the Southeast, and he posts more information about ancient Indian mounds than anyone I've ever known. I've only been following him for about two months, but I've been blown away by the volume of information he's been, he's been able to put on Twitter on a regular basis about Indian mounds and Indian civilization and, and uh, advancements that they, they were able to accomplish back then. So it's, it's been an amazing, he's an amazing guy to follow because it's just a nonstop flow of cool ancient Indian mound technology and, uh, and information at, at, Dan, in a city near you, most likely. Well, I was going to say, I have Indian mounds, uh, not 200 yards from my house, uh, in the back, the back woods over there, there's three or four or five of them. Unfortunately, they sold the land and yeah, it is Florida. So they're going to develop it into condos as, as we do, because we don't, we can't have nice things. Uh, and there is really strangely, uh, piles of like clamshells that looks like someone brought clams and and consumed them and then deposited them in a central location. And it started making me, somebody told me that would be Native Americans. I started thinking, I thought that, and then I'm like, mm, it might be Bigfoot. <laughs> but, but anyway, I don't know, because uh, they, they have a tendency to harvest those, those kinds of things to eat as well. Uh, but with that, let me uh, pass it over to uh, Mr. Frank Jones. Yeah, so I was um, kind of wondering if if you guys have like a specific site uh, somewhere around the world that you're particularly interested in. You know, perhaps you could talk about it a little bit. Um, particularly interested in a site that you might be familiar with that has quite a lot of work done in terms of like scientific analysis on you know the the buildings or you know the dating of of the objects and things in that kind of area. So uh, yeah, be really interested to hear. I mean, to be honest with you, Frank, I've not got, there's a few that I would follow as sites. I wouldn't got into any really massively, but one of the most important ones is the Serapium at Saqqara, yeah? Where mm. you've got down under there, it's a big complex. The Egyptian pyramids were built in fields, effectively, most of them on the west of the Nile. And that's one of the earliest ones. And there's a big, there's a big, one of the oldest pyramids, I think it's Doza, Doza, I can never quite pronounce it. Anyway, within that complex, there's this Serapium going underground. And you'll all be familiar with that because it's got 20, it had 24 of these massive granite, 100-ton type blocks, perfectly machined, perfect lids, uh, all buried underground. It was very difficult to see how any, even if we, Nate, could get, actually maneuver them underground where they were laid out. And... Uh, and they didn't seem to have much purpose. They're pretty plain. They're perfectly machined, made out of granite, very hard to work. And they seem to have some technological purpose in my view, but we don't quite understand coming back to my first answer. And that to me is one of the most fascinating sites because it's very plain. They've actually got some hieroglyphics on them, but they were obviously chiseled later on, again, by these earlier, older, or later Egyptian civilizations. You can see the difference in the tech. Apparently they were polished, they had some sort of polish because you can't make granite shine. So the level of technology is amazing. They're, they're not icon iconographic in terms of the religious artifacts or anything like that. There's nothing on them. Very difficult to move, very difficult to maneuver. So how did they do it and what was the purpose? And to me, it looks very much like they had some production or energy generating purpose. And so that's a really fascinating one for me, Frank, the Serapium. Uh, of clearly the great pyramids of interest, because well, that's probably everybody sort of looks at that, I suppose. And th there's loads of really interesting ones because I, the way I look at it, is my view is try to understand these little ancient fragments of what this earlier civilization was like. That was the point of Graham Hancock's fingerprints of the gods title. You know, you could just slightly see the evidence. So for me, 
when I look at ancient sites to try and pick up things that indicate where they were at, what level they were at, and what they were doing. But the Serapium is a, one of particular interest to me because it's almost like a plain smoking gun, as it were, but something else was afoot. So I'll, I'll, let me add on to that Serapium discussion. And Davey, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, what I am... All right, so this is me speculating on things that I don't have any business speculating on. Um, one That's thing, what we're here one, for. <laughs> one pattern that I feel like has been unestablished or unconfirmed is that the older stuff does not have writing on it anywhere in the world. That's right, yeah. It seems like there was a, a a time when people just wanted the architecture, the megaliths to speak for themselves. And then after that, like you look at the Egypt, Egyptian uh, temples and things like that, they put hieroglyphs on everything. So to me, the Serapium is enigmatic for the sheer fact that that is an anomaly in Egypt, that they built these amazing sh things and they didn't s sign them. They didn't put their signature on them anywhere. The pyramids don't, the Great Pyramid doesn't have anything carved into it originally. So it seems like the older, the things that have the mystery around them that could potentially be older than we realize are not marked. That's something that I find really fascinating. And Dave, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's something else about the Serapium that reminds me of the uh, Stone of the Pregnant Woman in Turkey, where the there, there was one of these giant 100 ton uh they called them bull uh coffins i believe they don't, they don't really know what they're for but yeah. one of them was actually in the hallway getting ready to be ready to be moved in place so it hadn't actually been set in its chamber that it had been designated for it so it's almost like something had they were in the process of making these things uh, something happened and they just called it off walked away and left it as is um so that's yeah. Is that there's, accurate, Dave? Yeah, yeah. There's one of them that they left, and there's one of them that had a crack in it in the granite. And if you look at the way they were worked, they tried to get all the cracks out of them so they were more stable, you know, in the structure. And that clearly, again, indicates an industrial process. So there's one that had a big crack in it so they didn't work it. But there's another one, I think, the one you're talking about. And it's similar in a lot of ancient sites over the world. There's Baalbek, there's the, the quarries near Giza where they're doing all the obelisks where some of these things have just been left as if people were working on them. There's one in China as well. And something happened and it ought. And so that might well have happened there as well. But uh, so it, that's another interesting factor which ties into this subject. We might not have time for it today. That of cataclysm and civilizations just keep happening on a regular basis. Now, I don't want to go we can get into that if we want. But it could well be we have successive cycles of this. And that would answer the question. We've been around for, what, 300,000 years, 200,000 years, anatomically humans. And we might just get to a certain point all the time and something happens. Because that would explain why we haven't advanced further in that time, wouldn't it? But I mean, anyway, that's got a bit off the point. But yeah, uh, so there's one that's got a crack in it, which evidences that they were more bothered about function than anything else. And there's one, I think, that was, seems, they seem to have just abandoned. So yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so, so what Dave just mentioned is what I was going to use as my, what am I most fascinated oh, with right now? Um, <laughs> the the Rikot structure in Africa, which is known as the Eye of Africa. If you guys are familiar with Bright Insight, Jimmy, um, I can't remember, Corsetti, I believe his name. He's been on Joe Rogan twice now. He has done some amazing uh, thinking and researching on this structure that has three uh, concentric rings in the landscape that was a natural formation that he is now proposing is the actual location of Atlantis. And he makes Ooh. very valid discussion or very valid points in his argument for saying that this is what Atlantis used to be, that a wave basically washed over the during this cataclysm that we're kind of hinting around as like this big game changer for humanity. At that time, it, the oceans of the Atlantic swept over the land of Africa and then swept back into the Atlantic Ocean. There's a giant pile of slough that came off of the continent in the water just off of the west coast of Africa. That is probably the key to the lock as far as finding out if that is actually the, the home of Atlantis in the past. Because if it washed it off, just like a tsunami coming through, 
it's going to be piled up, piled up in the ocean just off of the western coast of Africa. So that to me is the current one that I find most intriguing. But all of Peru is also my other uh, <laughs> fascination. It's it's an it's such an amazing uh, feat of engineering ingenuity and raw willpower i'm assuming that was going on in peru a long time ago that i don't feel like we understand or can explain at this point i, I want to say a couple things one thing i've already got enough questions now just from off of what you said to fill up the rest of the show for me um the other thing i was going to say is first of all everybody just give a hand for uh, dan and dave because this is exactly what i was looking for what i envisioned when i had this episode I was like, uh, I mean, you guys really just have knocked it out of the park, and we jumped damn near. We just got started uh, with with knowing about these structures and making interesting points. Dave made me think of that Netflix special, uh, "The Secrets of the Sakara Tomb," where what they uncover toward the end of that uh, Netflix show was uh, not what they thought going in, and found out a lot about it. Um, I'm not going to spoil it for those of you who are going to watch it because. It's, it's a must. It's a must for anyone who even has a passing interest in this topic. You got to watch that uh, Sakara Tomb thing on Netflix. Um, also, I want to say hello to the, uh, Julie in the chat. Uh, hi, Jules. Thank you for doing this. We have a couple. Uh, let me see if there's a question. Jules, if we have a question, please highlight it. We want to say hi to Benji. Benji had a great conversation uh, about Benji and his experience this week. It was uh, a couple nights ago. It was brilliant. Um, who else is here? Scott Guerin, my former uh, Air Force pararescue. Well, he's still my pararescue brother. Uh, he's just a former pararescue man who's my brother up in Minnesota. And man, I'm going to tell you, Dan, uh, he gave us a video of him, one, you know, which is like four feet of snow and that the Bigfoot howl is ever present in the background. Nice. Uh, <laughs> he backs up to a national forest. So need I say more? Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, let's, let's get with it. If Jules, if somebody has got a question, we'll go ahead and, uh, and rock it. Uh, and let's continue with, uh, our friend, uh, Davey Johnson. Thank you, Davey. Hi folks. So first of all, Dan, origins of the gods, oh, let me, Andrew Collins this. and Greg Little. Really oh, wow. All right. Highly Woo! recommend it. Andrew Collins as well with his background in ufology and crop circles yeah, it's a must read. So there we go. You both described beautifully there your prime examples. If you and you to take this to somebody who had no background in it and say to them, this is why you should be studying it. And given that so far we've only discovered 1% or uncovered, sorry, 1% of ancient Egypt, given that things like Gobekli Tepe throw the timeline back and back, and I love the quote, the more we uncover, the older we are. <laughs> what, in your eyes, would it take for mainstream academia academia, to actually start to change their views about this and start to accept some of this ancient civilization as mainstream? We've all seen the backlash that's come uh, Graham Hancock's way. What needs to change? Who wants to take that first, Davey or uh, Dave or Dan? I'll uh, give, uh, yeah, get Dan have a go first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'll, I'll I'll take the heat off of Dave and, and try to tackle this one first. Um, I I think that there would need to be um, the, the the layers of sediment is what the establishment likes to see. If we start to dig down to layers that we haven't dug down to before, and we find a structure, we find ad, um, evidence of advanced civilizations where we haven't looked before, that's what it's going to take. So one of the problems that Graham Han Hancock um, explained in his book, America Before, is when these universities go out and they're researching an area, they're digging down to 5,000 years uh, from the present. And then they stop when they find what it is they're looking for, or they say, well, it's not here. So what I think is going to have to happen is these, these same places, and just like I was describing before, the chances of one civilization building on top of another civilization is very high. Like is your house that you live in right now, the first house that has ever been on earth in that location. It's probably not. There was probably something there before a farm. Uh, or if you guys from over the pond, there's probably other houses and other uh, apartments and things like that from back then. 
So what I think is going to have to happen is they're just like the UFO community needs to open the aperture on the information that we're taking in and how we're viewing this topic. Same thing needs to happen for the architectural or archaeological world. They need to open up their aperture and say, hey, instead of just digging down 5,000 years and stopping, let's move that evidence out of the way and dig another few feet deeper and see if we can continue to find something else of significance at those deeper depths. That's going to be the nail in the coffin when they find a structure like uh, a, a, when they find a pyramid under the under, underground at levels that they shouldn't see it. They don't have to carbon date it at that point. The layers of geography are going to be all they need to verify it, to put a stamp on that time for when that happened. So that's what I think is going to have to happen in the future. They're going to have to find something at a certain depth that forces them to accept a different timeline than what they currently have established. Dan, just to tack on real quick, is there a place that you have in your mind you would start digging before Dave Mesopotamia. tackles this one? I mean, you okay. got to go to the, the Middle East. like that's And that's one of the unfortunate parts of the world that we live in right now is the the best stuff, the most amazing undiscovered things on our planet are in the most dangerous locations um, there. And then also the Sahara itself. The Sahara was, was not a desert 5,000, 6,000 years ago. Earth isn't a stable environment. We are very lucky in the society that we live in right now that we have experienced this long duration of time without extreme swings in our in our climate. We talk about climate change right now. Yeah. We don't know anything about what climate change actually is compared to what our forefathers and our ancestors had to experience and live through and endure through. So we're, we're lucky. We're fortunate. Um, the Sahara has secrets under the sands that have been preserved that we don't know about, that we haven't even, that, that has been lost. We, we need to find it again. So hopefully if, all right, so we'll get LIDAR for the Amazon. We'll get LIDAR for the underwater areas. And then we got to get LIDAR. They can scan through sand, I guess. And they don't oh, start yeah. to really make some gains. Ground penetrating radar and MOS. And I'll, I'll tell you, during some of those quiet nights, during my first and second AFSOC deployments was Iraq. They were both Iraq and uh, or Iraq, if I'm going to say it correctly. And some of those quiet nights, people would say, man, can you believe we're flying over the cradle of civilization right here? And um, this is like Mesopotamia. And and it just, you know, it, of course, you know, back then I, I would, had no focus on something like that. But but it, it's uh, fascinating. And, and I'm glad that you had a place in mind. And if, if Dave, uh, Dave, if you forgot the question, Davey, please no, restate it I, for him. I'm, I'm clear with the question. That's fine. Okay. The, the uh, yeah, I mean. I think Dan, I think Dan's right there. I think now, if you remember Globeki Tepe, which really changed the clock, because that was eleven and a half thousand years ago, something like that. I think anyway, whatever. It, it was that sort of time frame, and it was clearly built by an a, a organized group of people to do it. Now, the only reason they managed to verify that date was the German archaeologist, I think Schmidt was his name. He found soil, but could not have got there any other way. So they had to wear the date. I don't think they would have done it otherwise, because they hate the very, very setting the ways archaeology uh, the archaeology so there might be that but the question is what's the sort of archaeological equivalent of the UFO on the white house lawn really isn't it that's what sort of Dave, Dave is asking and i agree with dan again it'd have to be some big pyramid or some big structure but they are a problematic bunch the archaeologists i mean they've got the roots in the 18th to 19th century it's a period but it's very colonial and a lot of the beliefs around population movements are around that particularly in the indian subcontinent they've got some very strange ideas about that and really i think the archaeological discipline is more like an art history movement or a history movement than it is a science but they behave like it is and it really needs to be a more scientific discipline because they don't know what they're looking at half the time so it needs more linguists engineers astronomers geologists scientists genealogists it needs a proper multidisciplinary team because we're looking at some of these ancient structures but if, and they don't understand that they couldn't have been built using, you know, a bronze pickaxe and whatever, I don't know, you know, a bit of sand and a brick or something. They don't understand that it wouldn't do that. And so they don't know what they're looking at, really. And so they tend to miss stuff uh, or ignore it because it doesn't fit into their paradigm. And the other thing is you can't date stone. So what a lot of people don't realize about these datings we hear is they're very much contextual on what people believe is the date and is the historical context within that monument is. 
So that's why you get these varying dates and it's very, very hard to contradict it. So I think a lot of the stuff in South America, for instance, is a lot older, but it's dated according to that sort of, that sort of paradigm, really. When you got the example of Clovis first, where they wouldn't have anybody who went into America below 13,000 years ago, or 13,000 BC, or 30,000 years ago, it was something like that. And that anybody who come up with that, who dug deeper, who found anything out, they destroyed their careers. It carried on for 90 years till they all died off. I mean, Max, what did Max Planck say? Science advances one funeral at a time. And that'll probably <laughs> be like archaeology as well, really. So, so anyway, there was cases of people were told not to dig below certain layers, like Dan was saying, and they'd lose their careers on the back of it. So you've got things like already, well, Becky Tepe, that should have told them something was going the Sphinx and the Weathering, some of the age of the cities, the LIDAR, you know, and some of the genealogy shows, because they believed there was no population movement below before seafaring started a lot later on. Yet we've got clear evidence through genealogy and other things, shared iconography, pyramids all over the world, but clearly there was evidence of an earlier civilization and movement, but they just won't have it. So I think it'll be pretty hard to convince the archaeologists of anything as they're currently constituted because they dug in a big bunker of their own making and, and things just keep getting older and they keep getting tighter. They form the wagons ever tighter every time there's an older find. So I'm a bit more pessimistic, but I think Dan's right. It'd, take, it'd have to be something pretty big or something that they couldn't ignore or an honest, or sorry, an archaeologist who isn't very dogmatic, who like Smith's, with Lebecki Tepe, who gets his results, that body can stop him. Good stuff, gentlemen. Good stuff. Uh, now that we tackled that one, we got to get Jules of the Wood in here with her question. Our uh, chat moderator extraordinaire, the Jewel of Alabama. Uh, there she is. Uh, do you think that the worldwide similarities in megalithic structures indicate a worldwide civilization that had the ability to travel through portals or with Vimana? I can tell you that I don't I don't know about the portals or Vimana um, being a part of it, but when I see the, uh, the the carvings of people that are half fish, half human, or they're full humans, but they have like fish attire, to me that sounds like there was a global seafaring uh, civilization that lived on the planet at the same time as these other people and other civilizations did that they didn't quite understand. Like they would visit them and they would, if you see them, they usually have what looks like a pine cone in their hand and, a, and in one hand and a handbag in the other. And it seems like the, it's the transfer of knowledge is what these people are bringing to the other civilizations. So these uh, seafaring people that they just kind of said like, they must be fish. They live in the oceans, they come from the oceans. So therefore they're fish. That makes sense to me. Um, that to me is, an indicator that there was maybe not a worldwide civilization that had control over the planet, but that there was a worldwide influence on the thought process and the transfer of knowledge across the planet to where they could plant the seed in different locations and say, let me show you how to solve this one problem. And then you take it and you run with it. If, if I gave, if I gave you guys all a, a box of eight crayons and said, draw me a picture of, you're out of the outside of your house. You're all going to draw different things. Um, just like if I, if someone gave me uh, different tools, I'm going to be able to do different things with them. So I think that's what happened is there was a advanced civilization that made it through the catastrophe that we've touched. We've danced around a little bit in this conversation that was able to disseminate information globally. And then they, they wanted to keep themselves. They, they didn't just like today, in this modern society that we live in, we're all on the internet talking to each other from multiple continents. Mm -hmm. There's still untouched tribes in the world that we live in right now. If we go out and we give them a little bit of information on how to sanitize water, it's going to change their world. So it's just, it's not that you have to go in and you have to hold their hand and you have to teach them how to use all this stuff. You just give them a little bit of information to give them a, a kickstart. And that's what I think the, the the history records indicate with the carvings that I've seen um, that that are talked about very frequently in, in this weird world. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let me pass that 
to Dave, and then we'll get back to uh, Debs with her question. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of accounts of Vermana, particularly happening in India, and other types of flying craft in the literature, tales of craft flying. In fact, that's been a lot of the confusion with ancient aliens because people have ascribed that to aliens, but actually it could well just have been a more advanced civilization. There's one apart from King Solomon had, had an old craft, apparently. He must have got it from an old second-hand shop somewhere in the, the markets in the Middle East. But anyway, he had an old, I'm joking, obviously. He had an old <laughs> craft, apparently, and he used to fly around. So one of them was called Solomon's Mountains and fly around. And some of the descriptions, funnily enough, from what he sees from the air are pretty accurate, apparently. But the Vermana thing is well documented in ancient Sanskrit literature about the abilities they had some of the ways they could fly and it's, it's really it's, it's so if they did indeed master field tech and we need another program to go into go into the is that right or not but let's just assume that there's some evidence of it then you could see how they could do that uh, and get into anti-gravitics or using something sonic or electromagnetic using magnetic fields so i think there was some sort of ability to fly there just from the ancient tales and the like dan says the stories and carvings now, with dimensional portals, funnily, on a lot of monuments all around the world, you see these doors, very well carved, very accurate doors. They look, you know, they don't look like some, and they're all over the place. And the, a lot of the tales from the indigenous peoples there or whatever are about people traveling through different things. Now, it does sound a bit ridiculous to the modern ear, but well, maybe not to what our modern ears, because, you know, we're used to these things in other contexts. But if you, again, if you've made, mastered some dimensional stuff, quantum physics, things like that, there may well be something to that. And while we all laugh down, not we're us, but people laugh down the sleeves of it, I've often thought, why did they do those doors? And there are a lot of tales of people traveling through these doors, particularly in South America, to other parts of other complexes as well. So there may well be something to it, because if they have cracked a different science, as we're saying, that then... Uh, it, it, it may be quite interesting. I'll, get, I'll give you an example. For instance, you might have uh, the obelisk, for instance. One of the theories is that the pyramids generated uh, power, electrical power, and the obelisks were like some sort of Tesla tower, but collected that power. And within a radius, you could give out a thing, a bit like Wi-Fi, and everybody could use the power tools in that radius. So, so there could be, so, you know, so you'd never think of that, would you? It may well be the headdress of the ancient Egyptians he'd taken from an earlier civilization. That's psionic amplification. The man bags, I've often thought they could be a portable power source. So, I mean, I'm not saying that's correct, but what I'm getting at is a lot of these things that sound a bit crazy, once you think of a different type of tech, could well be, could well be, you know, you say, oh, yeah, right, I can see that. Now, so I'm not saying it's correct. And as I say, we'd have to have quite a detailed discussion to get to the proof, you know, where that may come from. And it'd probably take ages in a big <laughs> series. But, but I, I think there's something that was a very interesting question. I'm going to tell you what, that was a good one. And uh, I forgot I was about to pass it to Deb, but I got a question. I got to get in here uh, first and then uh, and then we'll get to the Debs. And I was going to ask uh, another question, which I'm going to save for my next one. But I got to throw some meat to the UFO base, if you will, to use a political uh, throw here. Um, is there an intersection, Dan, do you believe between other intelligences that are what we would call ufos but we could just call it a, a non-human intelligence and these ancient structures is there an intersection or is there that and i know this is hotly debated is this something that you don't see i um, do see so this is this is the my pet hypothesis that i i like to mess around with every now and then of course everyone when when they look at a ufo the first response is they must come from another planet the crypto terrestrial hypothesis, in my opinion, has so much, it simplifies the discussion so much that it shouldn't be ignored. And the crypto terrestrial hypothesis is basically that there is a earth based species that's far, far more advanced in certain ways than, than we are. They don't have a global infrastructure, but they would, they have different abilities. I don't know, like maybe how to move giant stones that we can't move. Um, that they utilize in ways that we don't, and they've lived alongside of us. And um, one thing that I, I think about is for our modern humanity, we tend to go, we, we tend to spread. That is our goal. We want to grow in numbers. We spread 
were not very sustainable. If there was a, the more advanced we get though, the more we get concerned about sustainability. Um, but we're not real quick about figuring that out. Another society that is more advanced than us might have gotten to the point where they did realize that sustainability of a smaller base of, we'll call them people, is easier than trying to do it for a huge number of people. So potentially there's a civilization that is much less, that has less, much less people than we do, shares the planet with us in a sustainable way that makes it difficult for us to detect. So that's where I start to wonder is, are those civilizations potentially responsible for the technology that was transferred to the civilizations that were able to build these megalithic structures that we see all over the world? And they just don't want to really like the fish, the guys dress up as fish. Did they come communicate, educate, and then leave? And that was it. That was, that was all they wanted to do. They just wanted to reach out say, Hey, and enjoy this information and let's see what happens. So maybe that's the connection between UFOs. Maybe they have technology that we consider so far in advance of ours that it can't be from here. And the perfect way for them to disguise their existence on this planet is for them to convince us that they're from outer space. If we're busy looking up and assuming that everything's coming from outer space, there's, we're not going to be looking. We're going to assume that they don't live here on the planet with us. Let's talk about Bigfoot. We think that Bigfoot lives on this planet, but they're so good at hiding and avoiding us that there's no chance or that we, we haven't been able to prove it. If that's a large bipedal primate, imagine what a more advanced intelligence human uh, version of a human would be able to do to keep themselves hidden from us to use to be evasive in nature and and we wouldn't be able to detect them until our technology advanced to the point where we can i don't know update our radars and start detecting things that are in our skies that they use to monitor us possibly so that's that's where i think um and and once again it boils down to maybe they were more dominant on the planet prior to a catastrophe that happened 11,600 years ago. And then they got reset just like we got reset. And then we've kind of risen par in a parallel manner to, to the point where we are today. And they just haven't advanced in the same way that we have. So a lo little bit of rambling there. I, I, I admit that, but yeah, that's where that's I think the UFO that's and the ancient, um, ancient history kind of blend together. And, and who are our gods that are, the Egyptians talked about who were those guys? Where did they come from? Is that a representation of someone that came and taught to them? Is that a blend right. of civilizations? That's a you. It's funny or, you put you posed a great question in your answer right there at the end. That's great. And by the way, some people would argue that Bigfoot is an offshoot of humans and is so intelligent in its environment. Um, obviously, it's not going to perform. And we discussed this a little last night. It's not going to perform microsurgery. But in their, the way that they dominate in the forest, you listen to a guy like Les Stroud, Survivor Man, and he goes, I am nowhere near um, the woodsmen that Bigfoots are. Like the way that they're able to operate in their environment. I'm just, you know, as a human, I'm, I'm, I'm great for a human, but nothing compared to them, if I'm paraphrasing what he said. So anyway, Dave, uh, would you like to tackle that one, sir? Yeah, I mean, Dan's answered it very eloquently on cryptoterrestrials, which is a big interest of mine, so I won't go over what he said. But I, the, what, there is one thing to begin. Plato's account of Atlantis, uh, the, the Greek temple priest said to Solon, who was, pre, I think he was his grand, great-grandfather, said to him, but this has happened many times, and each time humanity must be again again like children. So you could see the mileage in an offshoot of human civilization some time ago deciding to stay underground because it's too tricky. So you could, they might, they might have been around for a long, they might have been around for a long time. Uh, there's also the stuff around the stories of elves and stuff that Jack Ballet mentions, fairies and all those other connections. So I think it's quite a strong case for ET. And funnily enough, those three categories, I did an article about this last year, mm -hmm. and those three categories of science I did came from, so I think it was, was it field manipulation, uh, you know, earth power, and SciTech, effectively, what I come out of at the end of my look at ancient tech fingerprints. I use those to link to all the things we see now with the phenomenon, if you see what I mean. So you could you could say there's quite a link there. The other thing, of course, is sort of shamanic stuff and 
people having the tales of people talking to beings from other dimensions and gods and entities, and it could be that side of the phenomenon that people have been talking to as well. So, so, so the only missing factor is maybe the, the ET factor, but again, there are tales of people, the sky people, people visiting again, which they may well have had that same relationship we do. So yeah, I think it's all on the table really, but I can definitely see a connection to the tech we saw in the ancient time and the tech we see now. And the lesson for me is that maybe as we in the first question, that's a path we may well be able to go down, but we're missing a step We've made a wrong turn in our scientific approach. So we're not, and it may be a, a tech that a lot of people use, you know, but we, if we could harness. Anyway, yeah, so I think Dan sort of got it really. I've just added a little bit to it there. But what's, what's interesting though, Dave, is that they have chosen to interact with them and not interact with us and have left us to our own industriousness to a degree. And that's interesting, maybe because it, it, it portends what do they see about us that they maybe they don't like? Maybe I'm just throwing that out there. Well, well, the, you mean like the crypto? Crypto is what do they yeah, say like about us? Yeah, if if yeah. they help them, but they they're clearly not <laughs> trying to lead yeah. us. Well, you know? well, I mean the problem is, I suppose we're in danger of blowing up the same place they live, right. <laughs> or polluting it and killing them all. Right, and they right. might be just trying. And if there is a regular cataclysm cycle, they might just want to make sure we don't take them with us when we go. So they might just want to be easing as gently into that good night, as it were, to quote. <laughs> so that might be what it's all about. And, or it could be, and the third part of my article was about this, funnily enough, but it could be, apart from that dystopian view, but they try to tell us and help us, and that's what we're seeing at the moment, the activity in the UP world. I mean, that is massive speculation, which I like all of this. But that could be the other connection. Maybe they've got to tell us, and it may even if they didn't want to tell us normal and it's not their normal practice, you just like to see us all die and then help us out again. But in this case, we're that advanced, <laughs> but we, but we might, they can't let us go like that because we might take them with them. So that's a potential <laughs> as well, you know? So uh, what would it, uh, enlightened self-interest, I think the phrase is. All right. Let's, uh, and you know what, Dave, uh, send us the link for the article. It's on liberation times. I'll put that in the show notes not, along with, uh, there's another one actually. It's a it's a better one. It's a more detail on the Liberation Times one's all right, but it was uh, it's on UK. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link anyway. It's on Ash, Ash Ellis's website. I think it's UK identified. That gives yeah, a more real treatment of the stuff. So which is probably more useful for people. We will link it into the show notes under Dave Smethers' uh, contact info. Uh, Debs, you're up, my friend. Yeah, I'm just really interested in how often these structures are connected to star systems. I'm interested in what seems to be our attempt to always reach the sky. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. So reaching the sky, I don't know if we were doing that with anything except maybe Vimana. But uh, as far as feeling connected to the universe, I think they definitely had a better connection to their environment than we do today like we most of us that live in cities i don't live in a city if you live in a city you don't see a lot of stars but at nighttime when there were no street lights that was the show that was tv that was your phone you would go outside and you would stare at the stars and wonder i'm sure there was a lot of that going on um so i think that i think they had a particular reverence for that because it was beyond the ability for them to reach so that all they could do was use their analytical thought to think about it and try to figure out what it means and what does it mean to see those things out there when we're here on this ground on this earth so i think they were basically kind of paying homage to it and it became a valuable asset to when they started to do things like plant crops and they started keeping a calendar and then one of the things that blows my mind is that the ancient people were able to detect that the earth has a wobble to it. Uh, it's called progression, procession, I think procession, I it. procession. Yeah. And yeah. it's a wobble in the earth's axis that completes a full cycle every like 26,000 years. So over the course of 72 years, the stars in the sky shift one degree. That means, and, and what was the life expectancy of people? 10,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, probably not 72 years. So how did they, first of all, detect, map the stars? Second, map them so accurately that they could detect from in one lifetime or in, it 
transfer that information to multiple lifetimes to see the change in it and then calculate how much it was and then be able to make adjustments to their their information uh, accordingly so that to me is really telling and that is actually a way that they use to date some of these sites or in in graham hancock's case sometimes he uses those types of connections to date them older than what current archaeology um, attributes to those those particular sites so it's it's very interesting that they have such a connection with the stars um, but i also am fascinated by the connection that they had to their environment on the earth and the biggest example to me is the um, dmt connection in ayahuasca how they had to find this one plant to combine with this other plant that allowed the effect to take place. And the first plant made you puke for a long time. Like, why would you take something that makes you feel so bad and then turn around and take something else? And it gave you this enlightening experience. Like, how did they determine that those things would work together? I know a lot of people are just gonna say trial and error, but I've seen the numbers. I can't remember what they are right now, but it's like a bajillion to one chance that they'd be able to find the combination of the plant, the process, the consumption and then the, repeat that again with the uh, with the, um, the the second half of it of the equation to make it actually be effective so how did they know what how were they able to de to deduce this formula without the the use of microscopes without the use of a chemical industry that we have right now it's amazing to me that they had this connection with our planet and it extended into the stars and we don't have that right now that's what i want I want us to get back to the point where we do have that connection with our environment and we will learn things that we have just overlooked. I think we've become disconnected spiritually from our planet and there's a lot that we stand to gain by trying to reestablish that connection. Hey Amen. Say it again, brother. No, I'm out of words. I got to take a break. All right. Uh, Dave Smethers. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, that Devs. I don't know because loads of these ancient sites they're aligned. Well, you've got they're aligned to a lot of different star systems, particularly in Malta, and well, all over the place, all over the all over the globe, they're aligned. And I don't know the answer to that question. Clearly, one of the implications is that there's some sort of homage to some contact with extraterrestrial civilizations or something like that. But I don't think anyone's definitively answered that that question. Glebeki Tepe was a right aligned to some other ones. It's Sirius, there's Draco, and uh, Orion's Belt. Obviously, the Great Pyramids are built like Orion's Belt, so that's interesting. So I, d I don't really know the answer to that because it could imply some sort of link again to the Star People, or it could be something else in their belief system. Uh, you know, or maybe it could be a warning for us, I suppose, as well. There could be that, you know, like leaving us a warning that we can't ignore. But as Dan was saying, the ancients had a brilliant uh, knowledge. The Sumerians had a fantastic knowledge of uh, star systems, some of which we can't see today. So how did they do that if we couldn't see them? That would imply passed on by a more sophisticated tech. Like you said, they've got the knowledge of possession. Do you know that uh, one of the possession numbers is 40, the the pyramid is a scale model of the earth on the top half of the earth and if you divide it by 44 and that's one of the processional numbers you see these processional numbers baked into loads of different buildings and these relationships to such an extent i think it's beyond coincidence i mean i know that on its own sounds like but there's another things you've got the mayans who had this great knowledge of eclipses and again these massive calendars going back out to do that there was a tribe whose name I forget, they did a dance showing with the new Draco, which is a thing they couldn't see. Anyway, so it's a very old knowledge system. There's also knowledge that we've mapped the Earth. Ancient maps show that the, you know, the, the longitude. There's also knowledge of around uh, the measurement scales, show a knowledge of the precise dimensions of the Earth. Anyway, I won't go into that again into all that, but the point is, but it, they're all indications of much greater set technical and scientific knowledge. So I, I do wonder why they have these alignments. If it's one of those things, it's a really good question because it really puzzles me and I haven't got a good answer to it. Because none of the answers I've just given you is quite convincing, if you see what I mean. Uh, that's, that's what we're here. We're here to ruminate on all this. So we're going to make sure we get a last question by everybody. Uh, Mr. Frank Jones. Yeah. The drama. The drama. 
I don't know why I always do. I think you know the first time I was on cab, we did the uh, the Beatles thing, so I always feel inclined to do a Scouse accent. No Hell offense yeah. to all the Scouses out there. I've got I've, half my family are in Liverpool, so uh, nobody take offense. I hope that I'm doing a Scouse accent. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of something that you've you both touched on a little bit um, as you've been going along. Is is the you know the inexplicable like, accuracy and the huge objects and things like that in the Serapium and whatnot. And, I was actually watching, um, I think it was actually the Joe Rogan episode that you talked about, Dan, the one with um, Ben from Uncharted X with uh, Jimmy Corsetti, I think his name is. And so there was a, a bit in there where Ben was talking about the accuracy of some of these. Uh, I think it was a vase that they've actually had um, analysed with like a structured light analysis. And um, apparently the the actual measurements are accurate to within a, a thousandth of an inch and uh, he actually I wrote this down because it blew my mind a, a sheet of paper is actually about seven thousandths of an inch thick and a human hair is two to three thousandths of, of an inch thick and these things were accurate to you know within a thousandths of an inch it really underlines how unbelievably accurate you know it was and you also think about the size of some of these objects and how they were moved around and the the walls in Machu Picchu is it with the interlocking huge blocks I'm just wondering if you guys have like a, a hypothesis about what type of technology they were actually using to to do this because it's just it seems unbelievable that they'd be able to do that all those thousands of years ago you know there's obviously perhaps like a resonance type of technology like some kind of machines or maybe even like a consciousness aspect to it somehow so yeah just wonder what you guys thoughts are on that and let's up everybody's damn 401k with questions like this man go ahead <laughs> all right so i i'm real familiar with those vases or vases that you're talking about and they're supposed to have been made by hand i can grab a tube of play-doh and try to make something square looks terrible by hand like so so for me to believe that they can make these things as accurate as they did. And it's not just that they made them like a surface is flat. They made them flat in relation to each other. So there's something called geometric uh, tolerancing, where if you have a vertical surface and you have a horizontal surface, for example, if they are 90 degrees apart from each other, that's a ge geometrical reference. So the, the dimensions, the parallel lines between the bottom and the top of these vases is what you're talking about. Like the precision between parts of these vases that are, that are a distance from each other, it's just ridiculously accurate and over the top for something that is just supposed to be used for storing flour or who knows what they were using them for. And there's so many of them too. That's one of the other aspects of it, but something else that shouldn't be glossed over is the hardness of the stone that was used to produce these things. They are very hard on the Mo scale, which is just how you determine how hard something is. Diamonds being the hardest, uh, Play-Doh being the softest. And so there's just a, a, a that factor of it. And then the thinness of the vases, the walls themselves. So they were able to, to form the outside of it. And then they have to remove the material from the inside of it and get it to the point where it was as thin that so you could see light like flashlight through it um it's just amazing that they were able to do that thing um i'm, I'm rambling on about these vases and i think i've forgotten the question can you can you help me with that again i'm sorry yeah no that's cool man not really interesting it's, it's not rambly but the question was just like what kind of techno technology oh, do you reckon oh. it would have been that yeah. they would have been able to create that level of accuracy so my my brother actually asked me a question similar to this last week and i was kind of stumped because he's like hey if if these people were making tools or making tools that were able to produce these products that were so advanced how can we haven't been finding the tools? So that made me think that's a good question because you have to use something harder than the material you're working to be able to manipulate it and, and change it. So that means that you got to use diamond to cut granite. You got to use harder materials to cut softer materials. So why wouldn't they have survived? Why wouldn't we have found them? That is a very valid question. And so what I, what I always go to is um, maybe they're older than we realize and they were so valuable and um, that they got reused, repurposed, or maybe they got buried. Maybe that's what the big, uh, the 
chambers, the bull coffins. Uh, I'm forgetting this. I want to say in Saqqara, but I can't. The moth down in the depths of the earth that we talked about in the beginning. Uh, maybe that's what they did. Maybe they stored their tools in there. Maybe those are giant toolboxes and we just don't realize it. Um, but I don't know where it is. If you watch Brian Forrester videos, that guy has done some excellent work on trying to establish what types of tools were used. There are circular saw marks that be it would be an indication of a saw. Like a, a, I think he said it was like a two foot diameter or radius saw blade that would have been used to slice some of these limestone blocks in Egypt. So I think that's a possibility. I also think that these things could be so old that the tools that were used decayed over time as well. So who, I don't know, is my final answer, I guess I'll say. Now, that's, I also want to ask, when are you and your family going to Machu Picchu, Dan? Um, next sprint. And I don't, I don't have any plans on going anytime soon. Come on, man. You need to go. You need to go, David. Yeah, I, I think they use the combination of sonics and electromagnetics to do it, particularly sonics and the distributed, the atomic structure of the things to do. Because some of those vases, you couldn't get any tool in to do them. So I think it was like some sort of manipulated force, mainly sonic, because I think they use sonics for lifting as well, along with electromagnetics. And they used, they could force that bit like 3D printing, only control it and actually drill them out like that. And I think they used a load of things like that. In those big caves in China, that are very well, look very well machined. Does that, it, it's almost like they, they've, they've blasted the atomic particles out of there. There wasn't much debris as well, apparently, from them. And again, you can see the marks of that. So I think they were using field things to do a lot of the cutting. I also, they write about big laves. There's loads of evidence of like industrial laves on the statues. A lot of those statues that they've got are so precise. Chris Dunn's done that work on that. We, we could hardly do it today. You've got to use decent lathe. Some of them are set up for lathe use as well. Or they, they cut like they've been on a lathe. So that's some tech, for, you know, you know, for them, to, for them to be able to do that. So I think it's a combination of sort of good machines and tech and, and use of sonics and things and levitation through that, a force we haven't seen. I do think some metal tools would have perished by now, though. That's one argument about the tools. You wouldn't have lasted as long as the stone as well. It's interesting in Saqqara, just to get back to things getting older, that which was, I think it was a pyramid of Doza, they found all those vases, thousands of them. They've never found them again, they never appeared again. They were just obviously collected by the old king or pharaoh, shoved down there, and when, you know, and they were from an older time. And again, they never were replicated, thus again, evidencing their, that existence. But that's what I think it is, Frank. I think they were manipulating sonics, because particularly those vases, they couldn't, I can't understand how they could have done that with a tool. And I think there's something like 3D printing probably going on and get there as well. And I did wonder, and that was where the psionic stuff come in, which is really going out on the limb. And I'm already out on about four, aren't I, uh, with all this? Uh, you know, uh, where the, some of the psi stuff could have manipulated the field of, of the where the force went and all the rest of it, which may, may be taking it a bit far. But just one last thing about the stuff, the laves. So the, t the thinking is that some of those sophisticated statues that you can tell are exactly symmetrical and perfectly machined were actually from the older civilizations and the Egyptians repurposed them as their statues. So when you're looking at those on the telly, on the temples or in the thing, you might actually be looking at how these older civilizations were dressed without knowing it. You might actually be looking at them directly, which always blows my head off when I think about that. I'll, I'll tell you what, um... I was uh, thinking, Jules and I were thinking at the same time, the same thing is about, it's Ed Laskalnin, if that's his name. Ed uh, the coral, Thank you. Yeah, the Coral Castle and Homestead. Um, so this is coming from someone who has not done the work that uh, Dave Smethers and Dan, Dan uh, Warren have done. I think that he used the same process that they used in ancient Egypt but he set up a couple of those tripods as a ruse because they were not well placed to be able to lift and move the rocks that were the size that he moved uh, is my opinion uh, on that. But you know what? I want to let Davey get his question in there and then we'll, we'll get to Jules's question about that. So let's, let's revisit that in a second, but Davey, please go ahead, my friend. Absolutely. And uh, I love Dave's comments around, sonics and using electromagnetics yes. and it's certainly anybody 
who hasn't done should Google the robot that they've just melted and reformed using electromagnetics at Carnegie Mellon. We're starting to do it now with certain metals. Let's say maybe earlier civilizations were doing it with other substances. Um, so my question is, you're probably familiar with the, the likes of ley lines and dragon paths or spirit lines, as the Incas called them, or as the Aboriginal Australians call them, song lines. Do you place any credence in possible energy lines aligning with these buildings, that being part of this ancient civilization or ancient structures? I, I don't uh, think that it would make it particularly easier to manufacture the stone and stack the stone, but I'm not super familiar with the ley lines and what people uh, purport that they're able to help humanity with. Do I think there are centers of increased energy in around the globe yeah i think that's an actual factual thing how to prove that i don't know if anyone has i don't know but i think that also would contribute to some of the stranger aspects of uh life on our planet that could potentially be impacted by that particular energy like when we talked about portals earlier maybe that's the energy at those ley lines uh, where they cross maybe it is magnified and someone has figured out a way to manipulate it to benefit them so as, as far as what those things or how those ley lines are valuable to humanity i i don't have a lot of guesses on that one unfortunately right now but um the the dow rod trick where they can find water uh using two sticks makes me think that if water crossing under or traveling in a stream underneath the ground can manipulate sticks above the ground whatever the ley line energy is and represents can change things above above that area as well so it may it would make sense to me that there is an impact on the surface um, from what's going on at those areas but i don't know what it is i haven't dug into that too deeply to be honest yeah i was gonna say uh uh Dave, the, as far as the uh, centers of energy, isn't that where you're hiding in that church in Scotland? You got that 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 cup, you know, sort of along the rose line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rose of yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, getting back to like that, just that Carl Castle guy, he actually said that uh, he said he got his eye, he worked out how the ancient Egyptians had done it, or he knew, however he knew, and it was we fundamentally misunderstood the nature of gravity and it was all electromagnetics that was a quote from him so that that's really interesting as far to as far to ley lines i do think that we are a subtle energy we just haven't detected yet we're not aware of there's too many ancient buildings were aligned to them for it to be uh you know for it to be a, a chance right. and, and you, you see a lot of the medieval uh, mo the medieval monasteries are actually aligned to them now as well same sort of thing with ley lines are a deep ancient pagan thing and i think there were some sort of centers of power to draw on or something it's just again it's an energy we can't use because we're not used to it. it might even have been a sort of psychic connection or something like that there's a theory about the pyramids funnily enough one of the functions because they're all over the world uh was a function was to control the sort of geomagnetic fluctuations in the planet as well as use the energy and uh and and part of the thing the pyramid of Giza, it's got burn marks on it and it blew out because there was a massive surge in that geomagnetic energy one of the cataclysms so anyway the point being i think there is some sort of relationship between ley lines and the ancient monuments you can clearly see it and it's probably a subtle energy we can't detect i mean i i, I again as we were all this it's big speculation and it's just my best guess reading stuff but i definitely think there's something to it and i think in many ways, the old stone builder people, I think they might have been a remnant. They might have had some things at the tech. They might have been able to lift these big stones, you know, stone engine and all that. But they didn't have anything else at the tech. They knew acoustics, but they might not have known anything else. And I think, but they might have known about that science as well. So that'd be why they connected them up. So it's a really, I think it's real, Debbie. It's just, it's just another one of those things we've lost as to its significance. If we had that missing key, we go, oh yeah, that's how it works. But we just can't, we just haven't, you know, as so we can't make that connection. Yeah, this energy uh, line has been attributed to a chip shop in Mildenhall that some <laughs> say is the best cod in all the UK. And I don't, we can't find another explanation for it. 
Uh, but let me let me go back to Dan and let's tackle this question about Coral Castle because it's the only modern example we have whereby when uh, the I guess the kids would sort of peer into the structure when he was work he would stop working and nobody actually got to see a whole lot there's a lot of mystery there but there's there's the, the question Dan and then we'll we'll go to Dave with that go ahead sir um, I actually bought the pamphlet of information from the Coral Castle over 20 years ago and tried to go through it he wrote it in a very non-professional manner he's basically using the language that is easy to understand for the layman i guess uh, is how i'll describe it and i can kind of i kind of saw what he was saying but i wasn't believing that that is what he meant to say i was looking for a code or for something written in the text that would give the secret away because nothing that he wrote in any of those books or pamphlets or whatever you want to call them essays actually told you anything about how he moved the stone shaped the stone or anything like that so i think that there is a way to decipher the text that he did write and that would help you on would help you crack the code at least that's what i thought at the time that's what i was hoping to do well it was i was unsuccessful obviously or else i'd be living in a coral <laughs> castle myself um do i think that he figured out a way to, I don't know if he knew what the Egyptians knew. Once again, I feel like there's different ways to skin the cat. And based on your toolbox, you're going to solve problems with the tools that you have available or at your disposal. So how he did it might vary slightly from the way the Egyptians did it. And he might have made the leap of, oh, yeah, this is probably how they, they did it. But he had a metal crank uh, device that was generate that he claimed was generating some kind of electricity or a magnetic field that he was able to use to move the stone around. One of the things that I think is the most incredible fact about the Coral Castle is that, that the current location is not the original location. It actually got moved from one location, put on a truck, and then he unloaded it himself and constructed it where it currently what? sits. So what? That's, that's the thing to me about the tripods that throws a flag because lift, using a tripod to lift something up and down is one thing, but reaching over, grabbing a huge stone off of a truck and moving it, moving it. I don't know how you do that with a tripod. Maybe I just don't know enough of hoisting and rigging to be able yeah. to, to figure that out. But it really <laughs> jumps out to me as something else he was doing outside of those tripods that he had on there was assisting him with his goal. There's a story about that, you know, Dan, but he went, you might have heard this. He, Apparently, the bloke who was on the truck, when he did it, he told him to go away for a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was off. The block was off when he come back. And that's that's one of the stories the bloke, the driver, told. So this so is... Clearly, this, yeah, this, it's very this goes interesting back, that you mentioned that. This goes back to something that I've heard multiple people talk about. And I feel like it would be appropriate to say it for Ed Lee Scalden as well. Is that they didn't do it because it was hard. They did it because it was easy for them. They wouldn't have gone through all this effort if it was using a dolerite ball to smash on another rock one guy for five years to make this one block and then they put it in place like if if it was that difficult they wouldn't have done it something that they were able to figure out made the manipulation of stone the placement of stone easy so that's what i think edley scouted figured out in one way or the other that's what i think our ancients somehow figured out and we've lost that technology it's it's not with us but Randall Carlson has recently been on uh, a mission to basically claim that an ancient lost technology has been rediscovered and it's going to be coming out uh, shortly. My understanding is that that was what he was discussing on the Joe Rogan podcast that has not been published for one reason or, or another. Ooh. So hopefully that will come out and we'll learn more about what he's saying. Um, I'm interested, but I'm not convinced yet. So we'll, we'll, but we'll see. But final, final question about this, and then I'm going to go to Dave on this. Do, do you believe, do you believe without knowing, we realize nobody knows the answer. Do you believe he used the sec same technology potentially that the Egyptians did? I think these use the same principles. I would think the technology could be different as long as you uh, utilize the underlying principle behind whatever that tool was. Um, 
Fair enough. I can use it now. I can use a screw to secure two pieces of wood. They're two different technologies. They serve the same purpose. He might have figured out one way to do it, but the principle stays the same regardless. Right. And for the, for the audience out there that doesn't know, or even members of the panel that don't know, Dan is an engineer by trade. So that's why this is of uh, extreme interest to him. Not a good one, but I am one. I don't believe that for a second. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, well, I think Dan's covered it pretty well. I mean, to be honest with you, if you read the story and things, you think, oh, it can't be for real, this bloke. No, no, no. He has a lot of all marks. You think he's a lot of cobblers, to be honest. But th there is, I think, the core story in what he's done, and I've read it, and I was very sceptical. I think, he, as Dan says, he must have had some technique that he was using. I wondered in my guilty pleasures of thinking about this, whether he discovered something or found something that he was able to use to move it, but that's just massive. Maybe it's just a romantic view of it, that. But, yeah, he definitely could. There seems to be enough that he could move it. Well, that's all those pieces of coral are hollow, really, and we don't realise, you know, when he did them. But, uh, they I, are I, heavy as hell. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think he's, I think he, 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 he did able to do it, and I think the most likely is that he, he had discovered some sort of principle or he some sort of tool but he cracked it it's so irritating though i'm sure it was more irritating for him but he died you know uh, without revealing his without telling anybody i mean that has mm -hmm. i've often thought about that if it was true uh so i can't quite bring myself to believe it dj but i think it, I, I, if, I, if you were to ask me to bet me house on it i probably would have to say yes i do believe it but uh I would, but I wouldn't bet me out on it. I'd have to leave the room at that point. But uh, the, it, it, yeah, so I think there's a lot to it. But it feels I'm not entirely convinced. I can't say why, but I'm not. No, that's that's fair enough. Uh, to to me, I mean, kind of like what we do here is kind of try to figure out things that we don't know. And there's so much that we there's so much more that we don't know than what we do know. And so I'm assuming. Uh, based on at least the 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 uh, anecdotal historic slash historical record that he was able to move and cut these stones without power tools and all that, that he must have figured out something that the, as Dan said, it may be been the principles, uh, even if he didn't employ them in the exact same way, he used those principles yeah. to do things that I, one I man could not do, which is just, it's a modern marvel. It's not a miracle because... If, if other people could figure out how to do it, uh, then we could we could replicate that. But uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, let's put us all on here. Let me see if I can. Uh, let's see if we could do this, get everybody on screen so we can go with cabbie goodbyes. And we'll start with Dave to Dan, Dan to Dave, and then we'll go with today's cabbies. You've lost me, DJ. Sorry, mate. Okay, well, me... <laughs> so basically, uh, you know, if you want to say anything final to Dan, Dan will say something oh. to you. We're saying goodbye to our audience uh, and and uh, thank you to one another. But we're going to start with the two guests. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we've sort of covered it. Really, I think it's I think it's a fascinating subject. There's enough indicators of the different advanced tech they could have used, but there'd be something to it. I mean, how did the fact is how did they move those stones? How did they do those cuts the evidence that we see there's enough of a car those vases uh and there's a thing called terra preta you know it's a very advanced soil that they found around the world that's got these brilliant properties could only be made by sophisticated uh, process and it's all over the place and it's tens of thousands of years old to me that's proof i got i should have gone into it more on the show but anyway so i think there's enough proof to show that there's something happened and uh i think we, we just we just don't want to acknowledge it really and i think it's one of those things that will come out over time but inevitably what we think about it will probably be wrong but this has been a really good i was wondering how the chat was going to go in terms of covering the issues but i think we've got a lot of we've covered a lot of the good stuff then it's great to hear dan because dan dan does some really great stuff on this and i really enjoy watching his stuff so he's really pushing it in a relevant way so that people can understand it so yeah i've really enjoyed it Dan. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll say this, like um, each one of us can talk about music together, but it's not very often when you have like a high level musician talk to another high level musician. The conversation that those two people have completely different than the conversation that they can have with me. I don't know musical, uh, actual 
co whatever they call it. I'm so I'm so out of music. I don't know anything about it, but um, I can't talk to a polished musician and have an interesting conversation. I can't talk about megalithic structures to most people because they don't have that depth of knowledge about the subject. When I talked to Dave, when I read his article, I, it was like, check, check, check. Everything he was saying was like in my wheelhouse. So it's fun to be able to talk to someone like Dave because he is, his knowledge level is at, at where mine is. I, I, prop, his is above mine. I'll go ahead and say that. But it's great to be able to have to have be able to have this depth of a conversation with someone like Dave. So it's been really enjoyable to to, to do this. Um, and I thank you guys for bringing me on. And what I'm hoping that we get the most out of um, for people that know me, I make a lot of videos about UFOs and the news that's going on around it right now. My dream would be to one day be able to start to make videos about ancient structures, mm -hmm. ancient civilizations, things like that. But I. I feel like that requires traveling and I just can't do that right now. Um, but my hope for the entire UFO subject when it plays out is that we do end up learning more about our past, that our future and our past are going to combine and it's going to come in the form of a UFO. <laughs> I don't know. It, it makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you guys, but thank you guys for your time. Uh, enjoyed it and hope everyone has a good day. Uh, thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. We will we will do it again. This was a, a part one. We can do it again when you and Dave want to come back and do another one. And uh, and uh, let me let, with our cabbie goodbyes. We'll go to Davey first, and then uh, Frank, and then Debs. I'd like to say to Dave and Dan, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your insight with us. I've realised I've got a load more reading and learning I need to do. Go away and dig into this. Um, and I'd also like to say a huge thank you to my beautiful cabby family for allowing me to sit at the cabby table for this one. Thank you, guys and girls. Always, it's an honor. Frankly. Yeah, brilliant. I just want to say, I mean, obviously, uh, myself and Dave speak near enough every day about <laughs> stuff to do with UFOs, and we've spoken quite a lot uh, over the years about ancient civilizations and things as well. Um, but Dan, um, I've, I've obviously seen your videos of, about UFOs, but it was brilliant to hear you talking about all this and you're clearly super knowledgeable about it. So yeah, just thank you for, for all of your input and it's been a real pleasure. And I'd never actually heard of the Coral Castle ever before today. So now I really want to go there and I'm going to be on some website trying to book flights after this so um yeah say a prayer for my bank account and uh, thank you everybody Debs. yep i wanted to say thank you i agree with the way that ufos actually lead us to study ourselves it's really interesting how that happens it's almost like a magnifying glass on humanity when we look at ufos and the universe so i um appreciate that you're helping us to understand some of those mysteries so thank you for coming today my pleasure. I want to thank. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just said my pleasure. Yeah, I, and I was going to say uh, I'm so lucky to have such an amazing group of friends that we could do something like this because Nathan and I can endeavor to bring you ancient structures, but without you, we couldn't have brought you ancient structures because we don't know enough about it. So we brought you guys here today so that you can educate not only us but also the audience about it, and that we can branch out from just doing UFOs, we're gonna talk about Bigfoot, we're gonna bring you paranormal conversation. And we've also booked some uh, great UFO guests as well, um, just so that we can keep the conversation going into to more broader areas. So uh, this is exactly what I envisioned it was gonna be when, uh, when I kind of set this up with you two. So uh, thank you very much. Give us a like, give us a subscribe. We're gonna have Dave's details, including his uh, paper, uh, that you guys can read in the show notes. We're going to have Dan's link tree in the show notes. So go and check out his TikTok. And absolutely, Dan, life is really short. And if you want to talk ancient structures and do videos about them, absolutely do them and know that uh, anytime you want to bring that over here, we're, we're, we're ready for that. So if you so choose. So, okay. Duly noted. So, so for uh, Dave, for Dan, for Davey, our guest cabbie today, our new cabbie Frank for Debs, for Money Nathan and Leah Prime who could not be here, and Matt Knapp, uh, our Bigfoot uh, uh, correspondent as we call him. Uh, this is DJ <laughs> saying peace out. 
one love. We'll see you down the road. And as one of my heroes, Charles Corral, always said, I wonder what's up around the bend.